Hey, John, right on. Thank you, man, for taking some time here. To, oh, no to worries. This. Yeah, I didn't. Uh, yeah, of uh, course, um, you know, big fan, big fan of uh, of your work. I, you know, I've been watching the UFC and, and Bellator and all that uh, literally from the get go, uh, from the yeah. start, right? Like one of the originals, like when it first, you know, do you remember where you were when you watched the first UFC fight? Uh, my first UFC from, from, fight from one? was, uh, UFC, what was it? It was the, uh, Shamrock Gracie super fight. It was uh, UFC three, I believe. Okay. We were in my friend, Andy Hola's basement and his big screen TV watching, uh, watching that fight. That was the, that was the first one. And then we got a, um, a pan craze with Bass Rutten and Ken Shamrock. Uh, at one point, and then um, when they started taking it off TV, we I didn't watch much, you mm -hmm. know. And then when I got to Purdue, uh, Tom Erickson was one of my um coaches, he was one of assistant coaches, heavyweight coach, and he had videotapes. We still had VHSs we were passing around back then of his <laughs> fights yeah, nice. when, he, when he knocked out Kevin Randleman down in Brazil. Yeah, and uh, he was fighting in Pride, and uh, that got me sparked into the idea of possibly fighting. Yeah, that's crazy. And and like what? So going going from wrestling to you know straight up fighting like MMA, what did you have to do? Like, uh, I guess like did you have to talk yourself into it, or was it just like okay, cool, I'm going to take some headshots, I'm going to take some leg kicks, like. What was the transition, I guess, between, you know, wrestling and getting to MMA? It was just, I, I don't know, man. I wanted uh, something big out of life. And I wanted to do something bigger than just, uh, you know, I went to school to be a teacher. I really went to school to wrestle, yep. you know, and I had goals in wrestling. I didn't really quite achieve them. And I didn't really get good at wrestling until my junior and senior year. Right. That's when I first started winning matches. That's when I first started figuring out what I needed to do to to compete with those top guys. And senior year, the best I did was uh honorable mention in my weight class. Okay. Or uh you know in the rankings. So they ranked the top 20 and then they had four guys who were honorable mention. So I I had a one point match with the guy from Virginia Tech who was a, who was ranked number one at the time. I didn't even know he was just some guy from Virginia Tech, I thought. Yeah. My coach pulled me aside off the match. And said, that was great. That was great. You know, that guy was ranked number one. I was like, what? <laughs> I had no <laughs> idea. It was a one point match. Almost pushed it into overtime. Um, yeah, I beat another guy. Uh, it was like 17th at the time. That was a good match. I didn't know what he was ranked at the time. So back then it was, you didn't know who anybody was. You're just white fighting guy. You're just, yeah. Yeah. You, you know, because you just, uh, there wasn't videos. Nobody had a, a Instagram account to go look through and see what he was doing. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And then I decided, you know, I wasn't done competing. So I had the option of, of all do I pursue, uh, you know, a, a, a like a travel team, a, a U.S. Olympic team, something like that, you know, just keep competing because I didn't want to stop competing. I'm a competitive person. Mm -hmm. And uh, just becoming a teacher just really wasn't something I thought about doing because after, you know, they, they wait till your senior year to put you in a classroom to student teach. And then like within the first week of student teaching, I was like, I, I don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. I was like, but now what do I do? I'm, I'm, you know, five years in. Yeah, really, truly. Eh? You know, and, when you start and it wasn't just like, the, you know, the students or whatever, it was the curriculum. I had no say. You had no say on the curriculum. The teachers you talked to had no say on it. They the ones that had been there for 20 years looked like they had their soul sucked out of them. And yeah. I was like, I'm not doing this. And that was that was 20 years ago. I can only imagine what the school systems are like now. Right. Um, right. But yeah, I, I just it was an option. Uh, Tom had Mark Coleman, Gary Goodrich. Uh, Wes Sims, Ian Freeman, a number of those guys had come through Purdue to to work on the wrestling with Tom. Mm. And uh, I jumped into some workouts and I did well. I did well with these bigger guys. And then they started talking about the money and the adventures. The, the, the money they talked about was really exciting, but more was Mark Coleman. He's a good storyteller. And he had a bunch of stories about Yakuza and uh, crazy clubs and stuff in Brazil. And uh, that, that just was like, man, 
Like I want to do that. I want to. I want to. <laughs> I want to live that life. Yeah, truly. And and but wrestling is like the the key foundation for like a really solid MMA fighter, right? I I think I, I not just wrestling. I think folk style wrestling is very important um, in in fighting in general because it teaches you a lot of control. It teaches you, uh, you know, takedown defense, takedowns, of course, but uh with like judo and and freestyle and greco wrestling there's uh you know the it, you're incentivized to do big throws and there's not a lot of control afterward i just have to expose your back to the mat in order to get more points for those throws you know if i can go feet mm -hmm. to back or or get your feet over your head like i get i get more points and the, the match ends sooner so there's not a lot of control there. So you can see guys, you know, I've seen judo throws from guys, you know, today where it's a nice throw, they get the takedown, but as soon as they hit the mat, there's no control and the guy gets loose. Well, now you've spent a lot of energy taking the guy down, but he's back up. Mm -hmm. Which is a problem. Which is a problem. <laughs> and you know, you do that a few times and you get a little bit tired. Sure. You know, and they and they get uh they get a confidence boost because they got up. You took them down three times. They got up three times. Now they're like, Oh, I'm okay. I'm in, I'm, I'm in a good place. And mm -hmm. you're breathing heavy. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I think the uh, aspect of control that you get from folk style wrestling is really important. Okay. Okay. And, and of course we'll, we'll, you know, we know you as like one of the best Walter white fighters in MMA history, right? Like straight up, you were I beat a lot of good guys. Some and... of the best, the best you beat some of the best. I mean, Tiago Alves, uh, Diego Sanchez, that match with him was incredible. And at the time, Diego seemed like he was unstoppable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I beat a lot of you guys. And then um, when I started pushing back on contract stuff, they stopped giving me named fighters. Right. They gave me the, the toughest guy uh, that nobody knew. You know, um, Joe Silva, actually, he said, he said to uh, Crazy Bob, my manager, that Oh, we've got a new strat strategy to get rid of these wrestlers. We're just going to make all the wrestlers fight each other and get rid of them and then make the strikers fight each other and then push the strikers they want ahead. And, uh, you know, they ended up eliminating a lot of top guys um, who in a, a uh, an actual sport with actual universal rankings and you had to fight somebody similar to your rankings, guys that probably, you know, would have done really well were just pushed to the side and never really had a chance just because, you know, they didn't like them or they didn't like their style. Mm -hmm. Like, do you think that Dana White had something against you? Oh, the whole company had something. I, I, if you're not a company man, you don't just bend over and do whatever they say. Like they have a problem with you. Right. <laughs> and you went and fought uh, in the PFL in, in, in Bellator uh, MMA as well. Uh, yeah, it was uh, WSOF when I first went there. Okay. And, and, then, and, uh, and like, was it the same sort of thing across the platforms? Like, is it kind of the same just in general or? Uh, no, like uh, I was treated much better um, with, you know, WSOF and Bellator, but right. with WSOF, they, they just, they only gave me, gave me, offered me fights like every nine months. And that mm -hmm. was one of the reasons why I left was um, because the last promotional agreement I signed with them, I forced them to, um, sign a clause saying that they would offer me a fight every six months at least. So I was guaranteed at least two fights a year because that's, that's, I wanted at least two fights a year because once every nine months is not doing anything, you know? Right. Uh, you're not making money. You're not, if you're not in the public eye, you're, like, you're going to have trouble with sponsors, all of that. So when they breached that contract, I was like, well, Hey, you can either pay me the money for the fight you didn't give me, or you can give me a fight right now. And uh, or you can let me go. And they 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 said, where are you going to go? I said, bye. <laughs> and yeah, uh, at least me, you may be the biggest toy. game, but you're not the only game. Like, give me a break. Right. Uh, yeah. Like there are still places that could because they weren't paying me that great. So like there are still places to go where I could have made as much money or, or not. Right. Right. You and know, and John, I, mean. I, I read something that you would that they had let you go out of the contract because you weren't letting them use your name and likeness and likeness in a video game. That was that uh, like, 2008. What, what happened there? That was 2008. Um, mm -hmm. That was 2008 uh, after the GSP fight. So I went, I went, 
you know, eight and eight and zero in the UFC. Right. Uh, I had fifty percent finish rate, and then I got a title shot with GSP. After I was like a sixteen fight win streak total, I, I was a consensus number two in the world for, you know, five or six years. Wow. And then finally, I won enough fights to get put into position to to fight for the title. We fight. I lost. Uh, it was a fight of the night. And then they tried to make us sign a video game agreement for $0 for lifetime ownership of our name and likeness. Oh, $0. Zero dollars. Uh, $0. $0. Yeah, $0. right. There was also, wow. yeah, there was also um, a merchandising agreement that was also going around at that time. And I wasn't, the, I wasn't the only guy not signing. Like they were having a hard time getting anybody to sign. So they used me as a uh, a whipping boy, I guess. Sure. They used me as the example. Look at this guy. He's done this well. He's this successful. He's this top top guy. He said no to us. He got cut because they didn't. They didn't come and talk to me. They didn't say anything to me. They released me and went to the press. So I woke up in the morning and my phone's blown up. I had no idea that I got cut. Wow. Right. I hadn't even talked to my manager. I got, I had messages from people who read it in the news, like read it from the, from the, it's not even journalists, they're PR. They work for the promotion. Yeah. Uh, so it was just hit piece after hit piece, uh, you know, not even in support of me. It was all I like can support of UFC and like they were doing a good thing. Um, and I had plenty of fighters who contacted me and told me like that scared them into signing because they're like, oh man, like I'm no John Fitch. Like, what are they going to do to me if I don't sign? If so, they're doing that to John, like, what are they going to do to me? So then they are, all these guys started signing the merchandising agreement and signing their life away to the video game agreement. Wow. Dude, that's crazy, man. You think that they'd at least, at the very least, offer something. Like, to what, just because you're with us, you need to do it? Like, that's garbage, man. Wow. That's crazy. You're, you're not a company, man. You got to support the company. We're all in this together. And then right. they sell the company for billions of dollars and the fighters didn't get anything out of it that's crazy dude and like of course at the like you're saying like that's right after the the gsp fight and like at that time man you are like one of the superstars in the ufc and then, uh yeah and then after that after that moment they do just an all-out war to to get rid of me and and uh smear me wow Dude, that's crazy, man. That's blowing my mind right now. There are a lot worse stories from other oh, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. Too. Yeah, right? yeah. Like it's been a really uh the ugly, ugly business, man. There, there's guys who've been bullied out of contracts. I had a guy contacting me. Uh I I need to talk to him, maybe have him on my podcast. Um, but he was the original guy to come up with the octagon and use the octagon, and they bullied him out of it. They're like, what are you going to do? Sue us? We're billionaires. <laughs> wow. Was was GSP your toughest fight? Was it your hardest fight? Yeah, it was the hardest fight. I, I wanted that fight back so bad, though, because two fights before that, he got knocked out by... Um, um, oh, um, what's the... Uh, the uh, um, sorry, I'm forgetting his name here. What's that, babe? Matt Serra. Sarah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Girlfriend with the clutch. Um, nice. <laughs> Matt Sarah knocked him out two fights before I fought him. So I'm thinking his chin's gone. He's got hit too many times. So my game plan for that fight was just to hit him, touch him up. Mm -hmm. I had no, I had no intention of taking him down. I had no intention of grappling with him or forcing clinch. It was the absolute wrong backwards game plan. I should have stuck to my bread and butter. I should have punched a clinch. I should have fought him in the cage. I should have worked for easy takedowns. I didn't. I didn't try any of those things. And uh, it showed. And that was the game plan from like coaches down. Like you, you, you I, I, I like, game plan my own. I game plan my own stuff. I, I had a lot of people who were specialty coaches, but at the end of the day, I was my head coach. I was always my own head coach. Okay. And, and so how much tape would you watch? Not specifically to GSP, but like how much tape would you watch of your opponents prior to fighting them? Uh, before, I, I did a lot up until, um, yeah, man, after like the Gono fight, I just kind of like, uh, no, I guess I, I did the Pierce fight a little bit. Um, but there became a time, it was before the BJ Penn fight, I was just kind of like, I gave up on watching film. 
you know, uh, I got to a point where I was like, this isn't a sport anymore. I was like, what's the point? Like I was very in a, not a good place because merit, meritocracy was not what, what mattered. It was all mm. about popularity. And to me as a wrestler, that was, it just turned my stomach and it was hard to be a part of. Mm. Did, did, uh, watching tape, like maybe it would like psych you out a little bit like did that ever come into play like holy fuck these guys are actually they're really yeah. good they're good fighters man you no know, i um never psych me out but you do get a uh an enlarged perspective of them watching them on a screen so what happened a lot of times is like i built them up in my head and i worked hard against this monster that i'm fighting king kong right and then I meet him at the weigh-ins and I'm like, this guy's little, like, mm. these guys kind of small. I was like, he feels kind of weak in the hug. Like, you know, I would, I would always shake hands and pull him in. And that was always, that was, to me, that was always a physical check. I would shake the hand, I'd pull him in and pat the back. And yeah, to yeah. me, that was, I was sizing them up every time. How I was like, this guy? I was this like guy? oh, it's like, wow, this guy's short. This guy's kind of weak. I was like, he's got big muscles, but I don't feel any strength. Right. Interesting. Um, GSP felt strong. Yeah. Yeah. And people always ask me if he felt greasy in the fight, but like everybody I fought felt greasy. <laughs> <laughs> <It's only right. laughs> What's the was... worst you, you got hurt in a fight? Um <clears throat> well uh the um man, you know, I guess the actually at an actual injury in a fight was probably the Polaris knee bar, but I didn't have to have any surgery or anything from that. Uh, the BJ Penn fight, um, I was having neck problems the whole fight. And then afterwards, I got diagnosed with a shoulder issue. And they gave me, the UFC forced me to go to their doctor, get shoulder, shoulder surgery. And after the shoulder surgery, the doctor's like, oh, well, we misread the, the MRI. No. You didn't really need. So, yeah, so the UFC forced me to go to their doctor, who forced me to sit out weeks doing rehab on my shoulder. And then I went back to him. He says, yeah, see, that didn't help, did it? We need to have surgery now. And I'm like, why did you not just do the surgery eight weeks ago? Wow. Right? And part of it was because the UFC wanted to make me go to London for their expo. Because if I would have had surgery, I couldn't have gone to the fight expo. Right. So they forced me to go to their doctor. He, I, I'm assuming he lied. Because how do you, how do you, oh, we accidentally Whoa. misread your MRI and gave you surgery you didn't need. Like the problem I had was my neck and the pain was radiating down the arm and they tried to make it out to be my shoulder. So I had a shoulder surgery I didn't need. I was out for nine months. I ran into financial issues. I got injured uh, the first day training for my, my next fight, which was Johnny Hendricks. And I, I needed the money. I needed the $60,000 because I had two mortgages to pay and I was too proud to borrow money. Mm. So I fought him without really having a training camp. Oh God. <laughs> Dude. That's crazy, man. Like you're gen at, at that point, you're generally ready to fight. Like it's not, you, you, it's not that you can't fight, but those training camps are what make it so mm. that you can win. Yeah, and that, and that's a big part. The, and I mean, the training camps are are the hardest part. That that's a big reason why I retired. It wasn't that I couldn't fight anymore. If I could just show up and fight fifteen minutes and not be tired, I yeah. could still do it. But it's the training camp. I can't do eight weeks. I can't do twelve weeks. My body isn't going to do it. I can't. I can't put in two three day sessions, and uh, still have time and energy to to raise my kids. Right. Yeah. Totally. And when, when should parents get kids into MMA? Like, do your kids train? <clears throat> I've been, they've been training on and off and, and, um, and jujitsu. And, uh, uh, one of our guys from AKA Wayne Phillips has a little, like, uh, his, he's got his own little program that he teaches everything. It's kind of like his own little MMA type program. He does a really great job. They, they started there. Um, and then I teach a wrestling class on Saturdays. I, I force them to go to that and do, and do some wrestling yeah. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, it's good for, I think everybody should train some type of martial art mm. to learn discipline and learn some self-defense. Everybody needs to know how to fight a little bit, not because you're going to go out and pick on people and fight people. But I think once you understand your capabilities and limitations, 
you act a little better out in public, <laughs> I think. Yeah, no when, when you know what a punch can do to you, when you know what a headbutt can do to you, when you know how to defend things, when you know how strong you are or how weak you are, I think you can gauge your uh, existence in the world a little bit better and hmm. walk with a little more confidence. Yeah, I, I noticed that my my, <clears throat> my youngest I got too. My oldest plays hockey. My youngest is uh, kickboxing and pancreation. And uh, man, I, I can just see the confidence in my little mm -hmm. guy. Like it's incredible what that yeah. does for him. Yeah, it yeah. Uh, it's great. I think, and then, uh, you know, there's a great socialization aspect with uh, them, with other kids who are in martial arts at the gym. You yeah. know, there's a lot more uh, respect and discipline and stuff with, with that group of people. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's incredible. Uh, John, I'm, uh, I'm going to ask you a question. I know it's an impossible question, but from the current fighters, like who are the best in your mind, men and women? Oh, all man. Pla all so, platforms, UFC, Bellator, all everything. Like, who Yeah, are like uh, people, if you didn't watch the Bellator yesterday, the the Jason Jackson and the Kamura Dov, Kermer Megadov, I, I don't know if I'm saying this right, Lock, but that that was an incredible fight. And those guys are maybe the two best welterweights in the world. And we got to watch them fight last night. Mm -hmm. I, I would put either I would put money on either of those two guys against anybody in the UFC um or anywhere else, PFL, anywhere else. Um Impa Kasanayagwe, I am saying his wrong his name wrong, I'm sure, but he he uh, moved up to 205. He had an outstanding fight yesterday also at the PFL. He's he's fantastic. Mm. Um, uh, Potan is is very impressive, but I really want to see him fight a wrestler. I really want to see what he can do with takedowns because Izzy took him down. Mm. You know, if Izzy, if Izzy can take him down, I worry. But he is, I like watching him fight. He gives me an old school pride style fighter vibe you know and uh yeah, i like that reminds me of uh like a dan henderson or or something like that you know but I, but can he wrestle that's the question because there's not a lot of there's not a lot of big wrestlers at 205 right now in the ufc i don't think and not that off the top of my head no I, no no and unfortunately i think the ufc incentivizes stand-up fighting so much we lose a lot of the actual mixed part of the mixed martial arts not saying you have to go out there and they wrestle, but if you watch like the Impa fight, like he he integrates wrestling sometimes with his stand up, and when you do that, it opens the door to striking. It opens the door because when you have to respect that that other level, uh, you have to respect that level change. It mm -hmm. changes things. Like totally. the second time I fought Tiago Alves, I I outstruck him. I was a better stand-up fighter in that fight, but it wasn't because I was so great at Muay Thai and I was better than him at Muay Thai. It was because he had to respect the wrestling. You know, when you can faint and they have to respect the faint and you can let punches and kicks go, it changes the game. And, you know, I really like the mixed part of mixed martial arts. I I like, um, I love the one one championship small glove Muay Thai. Like that's some of the best stand up striking you're ever gonna see, but mm -hmm. most of these guys who do stand up only stand up and don't try anything with grappling at all, um, in these other organizations, other MMA organizations are never not nowhere near that skill level. So I'm like, why am I gonna downgrade what I'm watching, you know, to to sloppy stand up fighting, mm -hmm. you know? when I could watch one championship, small glove Muay Thai. And these guys are unbelievably good. Haggerty is un, un, unbelievable with yeah. the stand up. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think any, any MMA fighter in the UFC could compare to him in just a straight up stand up fight. Mm. Wow. And and what do you make of the bare knuckle boxing? Like, is that, I love it. It's going to, it's going to take off. Like it'll, it'll get as big as, I love it. I love it. I love the fact that you can uh, clinch and throw the punches. It yeah. adds a, a nice element to things. Um, the short rounds force action. These guys, it's a sprint. They got two minutes to make things happen. Um, they got five rounds, two five-minute rounds. It's awesome. Uh, a Chris Lytle, chef's kiss with his stand-up comment, with his commentary. Like, he's great. I love, yeah. I love Chris, Chris Lytle. 
He's from Indiana, and Indiana has a lot of handsome men from there. <laughs> yeah, great. I love it as well. Uh, hey, listen, I told you I'd be maybe 15, 20, but if I can steal you for another five or 10, I just yeah, got, yeah. there's a few questions I want to kind of get outside of fighting and I kind of get to know you a little bit. And I, I'm curious, John, in, in when you're finding time and I know your girlfriend's there, is it your wife? Your wife's there? The wifey. Uh, wifey. Much. When you find time, because yeah. with uh, with kids and stuff, it's hard to find time sometimes. But when you find time, what are you guys binge watching? Like, what are the things that you can't get enough fights. of? We fights. watch fights. We watch Still fights. fights. Yeah. She loves watching fights. She, she found me because of fights. Yeah. Um, she's great. She has more fight knowledge than most most people that well, I. Well, she, she schooled both of us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She knew exactly who I was talking about. You guys still go to, like you go to fight to actual fights. <laughs> Oh, sorry. What was that? Do you go to like actual fights? You go to the to the arena? Or I just, haven't been to any in a while, but okay. I'm usually watched from home. I haven't I haven't traveled to go watch a fight. Um, no. I went to some of the Bellators that were here in town, oh, but it's, it's been a little while since I've I've gone uh, out to a fight. Yeah. Um, just yeah, just busy with life and kids and stuff, so I haven't got to go to a lot. We we watch um some crime dramas and stuff. Oh, okay. We 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 we've been watch binge watch those sometimes. Uh, like the with, true crime, where you're like, holy shit! The, yeah, true crime type of stuff. We yeah. watched one that was a like, tell tell them you love me. This this uh, this professor lady was hooking up with a guy with multiple sclerosis and like okay. trying to pretend that he was like saying that he loved her and and things. And she was like holding his hand while he typed a T keyboard, and yeah. it's weird. Wow. It was a weird. It was a weird documentary. She's There's just, a lot of really weird shit like that on. Yeah, on right now, a crazy person. Yeah. And uh, well, it was one of the other ones we watched. Um. Um. The was it the lie? What's the one with the. With the sick girl that isn't sick. Yeah, Gypsy Rose. What, what's the name of that one? Oh, uh, there's one. It's a story. It's a true story. This girl, Gypsy Rose, her mom uh made her think that she was sick and they got all these like donations and they got to travel to disneyland and like she shaved her head and oh no yeah True story too <clears throat> and then yeah and then and then we didn't get to the end of it yet so i don't 100 percent know but i have an idea of what happened but like they found the mom stabbed like 50 sometimes oh, shit. <laughs> like she was like she lied about her uh her birth certificate like when she was born so she could keep her a minor longer so she could keep like controlling her wow it's a way it's a yeah that's not it's a wild it's a, it was a wild show we watched a bunch of we watched a bunch of stuff like that yeah, yeah it's easy to get pulled into that sort of stuff though right it's uh, bizarre and some of them yeah some of it makes me mad though because there's like one there's like one thing that if they told you in the first 15 minutes be like oh i figured it out you you don't understand but then they save it till like the seventh episode of course got like seven three hour long episodes and they give you the <laughs> one thing like you're like wait yeah. a minute if they just would have said that in the beginning there's no it's like show. a half hour show man like exactly yeah <laughs> um john what's the music in your house and as a kid growing up what are your parents playing we didn't i my parents didn't play a lot of music um you know, whatever was on the radio, mm. you know, I didn't get into music until, until junior high. And now it's that older sister. And then I would steal some of her stuff and, uh, REM and, um, red hot chili peppers. I think I stole those tapes and had my Walkman and I would mow the lawn. We had seven acres of land. Most of it was, was no grass. Wow. So I'd be out there, you know, 10 or 12 mowing lawn, listening to the to, to red hot chili peppers. Oh, yeah. And, uh, where did you grow up? Uh, Indiana, Four Wind, Indiana. Okay. And how, said, how much older Indiana is your sister? Uh, she's two years older than me. My brother's four years older than me. Okay. So like, yeah. So, so you, like that was like you know MTV was was starting when they to actually pop off and played music when videos. They played music, yeah. When I actually played music videos, and uh, you know, I I don't listen to like one genre. I just like good music. Uh, yeah, same. I mean, I'm more rock than anything, but I do like anything classic, really. Classic rock. I've been I've been getting into um a lot of outlaw country right now. You know, Waylon Jennings, David Allen yeah. Coe, like stuff yeah. like that. I've been been uh listening to those things. Um and then there's some new guys that pop up. There's a I, I just heard that uh Shooter Jennings 
found a bunch of music that was Waylon Jennings, right? He found yep. some original music, completed original music. That So we're going to get brand new, complete Waylon Jennings music in 2025 because he's producing it and going to release it. Wow. Like digging into the vaults. Here's unreleased. Yep. He, found, he found a bunch of stuff that wow. he's going to put together for new new music, but then he also found completed songs. Wow. Complete recordings. So he's going to touch them up and... We're gonna have some 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 Waylon Jennings music next year. It's gonna be oh, that's great. That's crazy. That's great news. Um, yeah. Have you ever heard of a guy as a Canadian artist named Corey Marks? Corey Marks, haven't heard. Corey Marks is a he's making waves. He's uh, he he's one of those guys like he's he's worked with like you know Five Finger Death Punch metal band. Yeah, yeah. yeah pretty big that. metal band. And he's worked with those guys and like he kind of works with like like people that are known for hard rock or metal or whatever. Mm -hmm. but uh he's a he's a crusher man Corey marks uh, country hard country i guess is kind of how you would describe mm -hmm. it very cool if you like that sort of stuff nice um good what was I your get first in, i get into some reggae i used to i i had like a three-year period where i listened to mostly reggae old school reggae stuff eka mouse i was loving eka mouse for a while okay yeah man i love that as well yeah like i, I think i'm i'm like you john like if it's good music i like it right yeah yeah yeah. And then uh when was it? It was like not when David David Bowie died not that long ago. Not that long ago. Yeah. I mean, I went on like a three month David Bowie bender. Oh and yeah. All I listened to was just David Bowie songs. And his his career was like insane. Like he transformed over those four or five decades multiple mm -hmm. times, man. Yep. Yeah, fantastic. Incredible. Fantastic collection of work. Yeah. Uh, agreed. Yeah. And what was your first concert you went to? My first concert, I think, was um, Pantera. Oh. I think I, we we drove from, uh, uh, I was at school at Purdue, and we drove up, my buddy Jason Hayes, we drove up uh, to Fort Wayne, and we watched we watched Pantera. That was amazing at the Coliseum, the uh, Fort Wayne Coliseum. It was the same place I won two semi-state titles. Oh, it was, nice. It was awesome. That's great. And, like, at the time you knew Pantera, you listened to them? Yep. Yep. Okay. What do First you think time of the... I heard Pantera, I went to uh Michigan wrestling camp and there was a a tape on the ground. Yeah. Right? Cassette tape was on cassette. the ground. I picked it up. What is this? Pantera. Hmm, let's put it in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, totally. I, yep. I once drove a four hour drive in winter time here in Canada. Four hour mm -hmm. drive, winter, it's snowing on the roads. It's like fucking treacherous highways. Drove down, saw Pantera in Vancouver. Drove back the like literally after the show to make it so I could get back to work the next day. Like <laughs> drove eight, eight and a half, nine hours just to see Pantera. Nice, that's awesome. I so got good. to see, what? uh, got to see Tom Petty. Oh also. yeah, never did and see I got Petty. To see, I haven't been to a ton of concerts. I got to see Tom Petty, and then I got to see um, Tool. Yeah. Oof. Well, Oof. you've seen some. Big shows though, man. Yeah. Incubus. I got to see Incubus here in San Jose. That was okay. fun. I got to meet the bass player. Uh, what's the bass player's name? Brad, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, they're from Calabasas, are they not? I can't, I can't not? even remember. It was like a five minute meeting, but like, yeah. yeah that's it was cool. cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as I got to go see uh, Cheech and Chong too at the Mountain Winery. That was fun. <laughs> Cheech and Chong, really? Cheech and Chong, yeah. When was this? I don't know, man. It might have been like 10, 15 years ago. Okay. Cause yeah, I don't know. Cool. I don't know that they're doing stuff now. Yeah. It's been, I, they're, yeah, pretty old. That that was definitely influential for me. Like as a kid, there, I, I'd like sneak in a record player, sneak the album in, you know, play it quiet enough that I could hear it, but no chance my mom would, you know, that shit was yeah. so funny, man. As a kid. So funny. I think, uh, I had like I don't know if my dad realizes, but I think he changed the course of my life a little bit because one day he he he's a master craftsman in the wood shop, right? He okay. makes all kinds of stuff. He he, like I I had a hard time like when I bought my first place, like I was trying to find trim and whatever stuff for it, and I was like, oh wait a minute, they have pre made trim because my dad like made handmade all the trim in our house growing up, and I was yeah. like, oh they just have like pre printed boards. I was like thought that was weird, I had no idea. Um, but one day he was, he was working in the shop and he had a, he had an old school reel to reel tape machine. Right. Oh, nice. 
Well, and okay. he put on it was George Car- Carlin, the 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 forbidden words or whatever. The seven, the seven the forbidden, seven yeah. seven forbidden words, and like, I stayed just far away enough to he so he wouldn't think I was listening, but I was close enough to hear. And yeah, I was, like, I was probably Boy, like right. six, six or seven. <laughs> <laughs> it was the greatest, greatest thing ever. That's, that's so good. <laughs> um as a kid did you get into comic books and stuff like are you a fan of all the superhero movies that are being made and shit i i'm a big fan of the superhero movie i do like the superhero movies they are kind of cheesy or whatever but yeah. you know but it's big explosions on a big screen it's cool it's fun yeah. right um and uh i didn't really have comic books because like in indiana the place we we're at like there wasn't a comic book store you know mm-hmm. There was a magazine section at the uh, at the grocery store, so oh, my mom would spinning rack. Yeah, so my mom would go to the shop, and I would go sit in the magazine section on the shelf, and I would I would read whatever magazines I had there, and uh, I spent a lot of time reading the back of Black Belt magazine, looking at all the ninja things you could order. <laughs> <laughs> you could, you know, like, throw, the stars, throwing and stars, and all that. Yes, you had like the little the little claws you put on your feet, and you could climb up a tree, yeah. like. Yeah, I was like looking at all that stuff. <laughs> That's great. Uh, which superpower would you want to have, John? Man, I Hulk was my guy. Yeah, Incredible Hulk was always my guy. Just crazy rage. Just smash things, big, strong, smash things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what's your what's your favorite sport to watch? If, if it's not contact, uh, if it's not uh, combat sports, I'm not really that mm-hmm. interested oh, okay really it's like the nhl finals stanley cup you don't care like i've been to hockey games and it's kind of cool but like yeah man i want to watch fights <laughs> to me to me like once i started fighting and getting involved in in fighting because i i played a lot of football i thought i was going to play pro pro football oh um I, I i you know wrestling was my second sport until uh, my senior year of, of high school and I realized like I'm not getting any offers at any big schools like I'm, I'm probably gonna have to focus on wrestling if I want to go and compete at a division one school and and do something oh. um, but the more I got involved with with combat sports jujitsu uh, fighting boxing Muay Thai all that like all the other sports kind of seemed soft Mm. You know, they all, they all seem like fighting without fighting. It's like, why don't you just you just put the ball down and start punching each other? <laughs> <laughs> just put it down and just start just start fighting. Just fight. Come on. Yeah, Quit yeah. playing the stupid game. Just fight. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> all right, John, I'll ask you a couple more. Man, I don't, I don't want to eat up too much of your time, but thank you again for doing this with us today. Uh, I, I, it's... It's an odd one, but I'm thinking that you probably got one. Can you share a near death story with us where you're like, holy man, I could have died there? Oh man. What do I have? It's a I the the one that I remember the most was being a uh what was that? Oh, well, yeah, okay. I well, I have two. I have one one was when I was a little kid. Okay, and um, we were screwing around. I was playing, you know, teasing, my me and my brother goofing around, and I got into this box. And my brother, as a joke, got his bow and arrow and shot a stick at the box. <laughs> and <I think> went, <laughs> what? Right through the box. He's like, "Oh Jesus!" He's like, he didn't think it would go through the box, and it's like, if I would have been like six inches in front, it would have, it would have oh. done some damage. Yeah. So that was that was probably one of the actual most near death experiences. But one one that was kind of like that, I was thinking this might be this might be it was uh, the first time I fought in Mexico. Right, I had just started fighting. This was like uh, my fourth fight, my second professional fight. Right, I went down. Uh, me and Brian ever Brian ever saw found this promoter, and we we flew down. To like San Antonio, and we had to cross the border and drive all the way down to Monterey, right? Well, we got split in different cars, and I got put with um, two or three people who I'd never met before, who they barely spoke English, and 
I drove across the border with them and I had a, like a three hour ride or whatever it was to get to Monterey. And we're just driving on this like little road and they're passing semis on the right side in the dirt and stuff. And I'm just like, where am I going? Like, is this it? Is this it? Is this like, am I, is the cartel got me? I was like, what is happening? Like, I had no idea what was happening until we got to the hotel and I see, I finally see somebody I recognize. I was like, Oh, Oh my God. I was like, that's, that's wild. <laughs> like, sure, what do you think they're like what do you think about mexico what do you think it's going to be like i was like i don't know i was like i hope they don't hope they're not stabby down here <laughs> so i'm really poor i have no money no family to come and get me either <laughs> oh my god yeah dude uh yeah i think the arrow the uh the, the shooting the stick at the start there was like yeah yeah i'll be pretty close yeah it was yeah yeah uh no, and this never one forget the... no shit you know my, oh, my brother oh, never once, forget uh, that I, it's you, locked in my head you remember those lawn darts when we were little kids oh yeah we my, we play with those a lot and my brother chucked oh. one up in the air and we used to play this game uh where you take a screwdriver and you throw it near the other person's foot right and then they have to separate they have to spread their feet a little bit further to the next place where you throw the screwdriver <laughs> until <laughs> the one day my mom got hit in the foot and then that game stopped yeah yeah my brother got caught the lawn lawn dart right in his leg he went to catch oh. it he was like eight or nine years old went to catch it oh. stuck right in his right in his leg okay john last question could be the toughest could be the easiest can you pick one career highlight one career highlight Man, the the fight week, the whole ten days or so that I was in Brazil for that fight with Eric Silva, that mm. was just the whole. And honestly, the the training camp, like you could you could literally write a movie about it. I think because the situation I was in, like the UFC clearly did not like me. They wanted to get rid of me. They brought me to Brazil to lose. Um, Every, all the cards were stacked against me younger more exciting fighter this guy was it he was the next gsp that's what they're selling him. they're calling the king of rio i mm -hmm. had to go into his backyard and uh you know just the all everything i was going through at home because like i was hurting for money you know i was hurting for money i was trying to pay two two mortgages at the time um and uh, yeah, just the situation. Like I called it. I said, I'm going to win this fight and it's going to be fight of the night and I'm going to get a big fat bonus. And uh, it happened. I, I Babe Ruthed it. I, I picked my shot. I called it. Pointed like, there we go. At the beginning. So they, I can't remember what the, what it is in Brazil, in Portuguese, but they, they, cheer, they chant this thing. You're going to die. You're going to die. Right. That, that's what sure. they say, especially when you're up against the Brazilian guy. Sure. By the by the beginning of the third round, I started pumping the crowd up. Like the crowd started cheering for me mm. in that fight. I had a, I had a Rocky moment in that situation. Wow. And that, that, that was just one of the most uh, epic experiences I've ever partake, partaken in. Yeah. 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 yeah that's incredible to, to go somewhere else, go to somebody else's backyard and have their fans start to cheer for you. Yep. And then, yeah. And, and like, love me for, for it and like it was great and i got a few days to hang out in brazil and went to the edge of uh edge of the rainforest and hung out had some nice coffee and some great food and it was just amazing it was an amazing that's cool. trip that's got to be one of the best things about what you did uh you know, why, i think that's probably the biggest reason why i started fighting was because um when i i didn't i didn't go on a lot of vacations when i was a kid we went to florida a few times we didn't go to a lot of places. Um, but when I started wrestling at Purdue, we got to drive and travel to different places. And that was awesome. I got to see different parts of America mm -hmm. uh, and, and stay in different hotels. And that was just really fun to me. So when I started fighting, it was just a bigger, you know, a bigger part of that. Like my fourth fight ever, we got, I got to go to Mexico. Like it's crazy. I only made like 400 bucks, but. <laughs> but you were in Mexico. <laughs> yeah, but I was in Mexico, man. It was great. Yeah, that's great. John, thank you again, man, for uh for taking some time here today fun, uh, to join thank us. Very much. Where is I the had fun? Thank you, man. Yeah, I, I had fun as well. Where uh is the best place for people to fall? Like, where are you most active? I guess online. Well, you can go to johnfish.net and sign up for my newsletter. 
Okay. And then get updates and stuff. And I have sales because I, I have a, a lot of programs on uh, Gumroad that I sell. There are technique uh, videos from seminars. Uh, I have uh, my lifting program, my meal plans on there. Mm. Uh, I have a resistance band training course and stuff uh, people can look into. Um, I offer online coaching also. Um, but yeah, uh, johnfitch.net spelled out uh, is my Twitter handle. Uh, John Fitch Smash is my Instagram. Uh, <laughs> no, official it. John. I love official. that. It's like when you're like a oh, Hulk's my favorite. It's like, oh, now yeah. I understand the Instagram. Now yeah. I get it. Well, also my I have an LLC. My LLC is Fitch Smash LLC. The Smash is an acronym, right? Simple okay. measures against serious hostiles. Because right? oh. I have my Fitch Smash system. I have a full. I have a fighting system. That's what I teach. Uh, uh, my online stuff is. So. Um, yeah, over the years, I've I've created a base model of fighting that can take you from knowing nothing to being a decent fighter a lot faster than anything I think I've seen anybody else do. Yeah. Cuts a lot of the fat away, uh, you know, because with jujitsu and a lot of other fighting, you get a lot of techniques dumped in front of you, and you got to learn them and then put them together in a system. So I kind of shortcut it for you. Mm. Um, but yeah, my my. Uh, Official John Fitch is uh, the YouTube, and I do a, a podcast. It'll be tonight, um, Sunday, 7 p.m. on the left coast, and uh, people can stop in. I, I interact with the chat often, and I talk about the fights that just happened over the weekend. So I got a lot to talk about. We had Bare Knuckle, uh, PFL, Bellator, and a UFC. So there was a lot of fights. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Well, thanks again, man. Um... I guess we'll tag you when we're chucking the stuff around online and, uh, awesome. and we'll see you soon. Cool, man. Good talking okay. to you. Thanks, John. Take care, man. Have a great day.